This is Eyewitness News Up Close with Bill Witter. The race for President of the United States now in high gear with the conventions behind them, Democratic nominee Kamala Harris and Republican nominee Donald Trump ready to battle, politically speaking, for the next 72 days. While Harris has risen in the polls and energized the Democratic base, both sides say this remains tight in many of the battleground states. And that, of course, will likely decide this election. This morning, we talked to Senate Majority Leaders Chuck Schumer and from New York. But we also talked to former Republican governor of New Jersey, Christy Todd Whitman. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Up Close. I'm Bill Ritter. The Democratic transition is now official. President Biden has passed the torch to his vice president, Kamala Harris, and she accepted her nomination at this past week's convention in Chicago. Democrats were so worried about Biden have, have quickly rallied now for his vice president. One of the people Mr. Biden met with before ending his re-election bid was New York's senior U.S. Senator Charles Schumer. He is, of course, also the Senate Majority Leader, who also worked with Harris in both her roles as vice president and when she was in the U.S. Senate. I talked to Senator Schumer. Senator, good to see you. Thank you for joining us on Up Close. Likewise, Bill. Great to be with you from Chicago. As always, let's get right to the nut of all this. Five weeks ago, it seemed your party was in chaos. It doesn't seem anywhere near that today. Well, let me tell you, Bill, I have been at every Democratic convention since 1984 in San Francisco. This is not only the happiest convention, which it is, it's the most unified. We're just about totally unified. Even when people have different views, they want to be unified to win. It is also the most focused on winning because we believe we have so much to do to help Americans, average uh, working family Americans and New Yorkers to do better. And we also are focused because we fear that a Donald Trump presidency could really hurt average folks and hurt our democracy. You have been so the combination of unity, focus and joy is all in this con is all in this convention. And joy was a word that was used a lot during the four day convention. L let me ask you this. How worried were you, Senator? Uh, you've, been in con you've been in politics a long time, seen a lot of things, different things, all over the board. Never seen anything like this. I'm sure you have not. Uh, how worried were you? Yeah, I oh, never have. Ago? I was, look, we were all very, very worried. Um, but now that we're in this situation, I think people just are so admire President Biden for what he did. Because to step down with all the power and everything else you have, it's rare. You rarely see it in history. But Joe Biden realized that it was so important for himself, his party, but most of all his country, um, that he not, uh, you know, that he, he do what he did, um, that he goes into history books as a real hero. And he was beloved at this convention. Yeah, and heard. even during the times when people were critical of him, it wasn't, it wasn't because they didn't like Joe Biden or admire Joe Biden or respect his enormous legacy, but it was much rather because, you know, they were afraid of the consequences of a Trump presidency. I think the emotional part of it when he spoke this last week was, you know, he said, yeah, I love my job as president, but I love my country more. I think that sums it up, Bill. You did it. He did it very well when he said that. And as I said, it's a rare act of grace and generosity and actually strength as well as humility uh, to do what he did. Uh, there was, it was surprising to me, I, I think to a lot of people, just a lay person, politics aside, this, this convention of Democrats in Chicago had a lot of Republicans there who were speaking there, who were not voting for their candidate this time. We, we have found in state after state bill, here in New York as well, that there are a large number of Republicans who <clears throat> might not agree with the Democrats on every issue, but they realize that Donald Trump's presidency is such a danger to our democracy. I mean, you can be a Republican, a Democrat, a liberal, a conservative. You love this country. You love this democracy. And Donald Trump has actually stated that he wants to change this democracy in radical ways. At one point, he said, we won't have to have another election. Well, what the heck does that mean other than a dictatorship? And then you have, you know, the Supreme Court allied with him, and they say that even if you uh, commit a crime, um, that you're not going to be held responsible for it. People are really worried beyond the ideological differences of the party about the future of democracy, and a good number of them are Republicans, and a majority of independents now believe that too. 
I, I wonder what's, what the future is here at this race in the next you know, three or so months, a little less than that. Uh, what's going to happen? Uh, during these next three okay, months. Well, and I are think, we going to have a I lack of Kamala, vit, vit, vitriol? That's what I think a lot of Americans are wondering about. Yeah, well, I hope not. Kamala Harris is really focused on things that help people. Let me give you one example. We talk about young people and their worries about the future. One of the big worries people, young people, to say 25 to 40, starting out a family, have here in New York and around the country is owning a home. You know, if you pay rent, you don't get any equity. The money goes down the drain. You, pay your rent for your house, but, you know, but if you have a mortgage, you build equity. Well, most, many young people do make enough income to afford the monthly mortgage payment, but what they're lacking is enough money, enough savings for the down payment. The amount of down payment has gone up uh, recently. So what Kamala proposed, one of the first things she proposed, was $25,000 help from the federal government for first-time home buyers. And we'd make back that money over the years as more and more houses uh, went on the market and paid property tax and stuff like that. It's a brilliant idea. And the younger people I've talked to in New York are amazed that she was so quick to propose it. And it's something, one of the number one things they care about, which is finding a good home and being able to afford it. Let's talk about the vitriol for so, a second. So there's that. Wait, I, I, missed the, I missed the second point. Go so ahead. you contrast that, real policies, with what Donald Trump does, which is name call. What he does is divide people. He points his finger at this group or that group, a different group every day, create that kind of divisiveness, nastiness, and lack of respect for just fellow people, fellow human beings. And I think the contrast is great for us. Yeah. So what Kamala has to do is focus on the issues. She has to fend off some of these attacks from Trump, but she's a former prosecutor. He was afraid to debate her for a while. She said she'd go for the debate right away. He said no, and then he was forced to by public pressure. So all this makes a big difference. Uh, a lot of his uh, advisors and some of the people who run his campaign and a lot of Republicans who are either close to him or not close to him are begging him to stop with the vitriol and get to the to the politics of it, right? Because this is a, a lot about what the future is. You just talked about housing and we got a lot to talk about housing. You know, young people where we are, where I am right now in the newsroom, the young yeah. people who, when I was their age, had my first house, they're not thinking about getting a house, but it's about the issues. Same thing. What it, what it, what it will take it to make Mr. Trump think about this. I'm thinking about Nikki Haley who says, uh, Mr. Former President, you got to start talking about issues. You can't be saying you're prettier well, than, you know, than the Vice President. One of the reasons Trump's numbers have been so poor and he's been unpopular with the majority of the American people, even some of them who voted for him don't like him, is just that, that he's much more um, interested and inclined to call names, to be nasty, to be vitriolic instead of proposing things that make, make things better. And will he change? Well, I thought it was pretty, pretty um, significant that at the Republican convention, now at that point he's at the top of his game, Joe Biden hadn't uh, said he's not going to run again, so he's ahead in the yep. polls and everything. And he has a, a, a convention there, everyone seems happy and unified. And instead in his speech after the first hour we read from the teleprompter and it was positive, he went into his usual vicious, nasty and dishonest name calling. So I don't know if he can change. That's who he is. He, th he likes he, being like that. He says but that. I would, I would, t I would predict that it's going to lose him the election by more than he, most people even think. There are a lot of people, though, that think the, the other key votes in the center, central states that you really got to do this in terms of electoral college, those are up for grabs and are very tight. Well, the recent polls show those Midwestern states are moving in Kamala's direction. They were in Trump's camp before uh, President Biden decided not to run, but they're now in Kamala's yep. camp. And having Tim Walls, a real people, anyone who watched his speech, he's a real son of the Midwest, a football coach, he's a high school teacher, somebody who knows what average folks go to, born and raised in Nebraska, now in Minnesota. I thought it was a very wise choice of Kamala. There were many good choices, don't get me wrong. But to pick someone from the heart of the Midwest, not just geographically, but sort of soul-wise. With some quick answers, because you're running out of time, and I could talk to you for an hour, but we have a lot less than that. Real quickly, can you keep the Senate? I believe we can keep the Senate. 
Our senators are busy really working hard for their states. You know, all the great work we did in 21, 22 with infrastructure and chip fabs is now coming to fruition. When Joe Biden talked about it in the abstract, it didn't matter that much. He said, I'm building 500 bridges. When Bob Casey says, I am getting $250 million to redo that decrepit bridge mm -hmm. in the Susquehanna um, that, was, that the central Pennsylvania so desperately wanted, it makes a huge difference. I believe we will keep the Senate. Okay. Um, we're, we're recording this on Thursday before the nighttime, the last day of the convention. Uh, we're airing on Sunday. So with that in mind, uh, if they're gonna, people are going to watch this on Sunday, what do you think Kamala Harris has to do on the last night except in her accepted speech? to really win this campaign? She has to do two things. She has to first and foremost talk about who she is, where she comes from. She then has to lay out some policies like the one I mentioned, $25,000 for first time home buyers to help young, young homeowners finally own a home. And she also has to prosecute the case against Donald Trump and why he'd be a bad president. Okay. I think we'll see all three. Okay, one final question. Uh, you were one of the people, not of, of a few people who went to uh, the House of the President in Maryland to talk to him before he made his decision. What was that discussion like? Well, it was heartfelt, it was sincere, and um, the President and I, um, you know, we talked in, in some depth, but I'm going to keep the details of that quiet right now, other than to say it was very respectful on both sides. Was it difficult for you to get Get of on the course. car, get in a car of and course. do that. I yeah. know the man. I worked with him since we passed the Brady Law and the Assault Weapons Ban together in 94. So it was difficult, but I felt I, okay. what I, I, going there and talking to him and telling him what I thought I felt I was an obligation, not just to myself, but to my constituency in New York and the country. New York's Senator Chuck Schumer, we appreciate this. Thanks, Bill. And nice right, to see you. Good luck to you, sir. Or nice hear to see you. you. <laughs> Thanks. And we thank Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Now, a former governor of New Jersey, a Republican governor, Christy Todd Whitman. Governor, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Good and, to be with you again. Good to see you as well. Let me get your take. I know you watched both sets of conventions. What's your take of each one? Well, I thought the Republicans was very well organized. It was very prompt. Everything went according to plan. Felt very programmed, though. It lacked a spirit, whereas... The Democratic Party, they even meant that made the calling of the role fun when they played different songs for each state. I mean, it's been a spontaneous, hopeful, upbeat. You know what? It frankly reminded me of Republican conventions of old because we used to be a party of, of enthusiasm, of love for the country, respect for the rule of law and the Constitution. That was never even an issue we had to discuss. It was something that was just inbred, and we were very hopeful people, keeping government out of people's everyday lives, uh, seeing a role for it, but trying to limit it. It was a totally different party, and it was reflected in those two conventions. We saw a lot of Republicans who were actually speaking at the Democratic convention. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you take, make of the Democratic side? Well, I thought that was very smart on their part. There are a number of us who are still registered as Republicans. I'm registered because Forward Party isn't a registered, recognized party in New Jersey at the moment. But, I mean, it, what we're saying is, look, there's a time to put party politics aside and remember the principles. If we lose our respect for the rule of law and the Constitution, we lose the United States. I mean, we really do. We lose our way of life. Uh, if you don't, you can't grow an economy. You can't have safe streets if you don't have those protections, those guardrails, the rule of law and the Constitution. And what Donald Trump has said, what he has done, what he did in his first term, um, has told you he has no interest in that. Uh, the rule of law doesn't apply to him. It Constitution's is, an inconvenient document. You, you call it the Republican Party, but it really is the Donald Trump Party at this point. Yeah, it's, it's a cult. It's not really a party because it just does whatever he says to do and it takes the issues that he says when he says it. Um, unfortunately, what makes it so difficult for people is both he and J.D. Vance will say anything and they will flat out lie. Now, do politicians stretch the truth? Yeah, they do. Um, that's happened on the Democrat side, too. But this is more than that. And he still 
going after the 2020 election. Yeah. And he's denigrating people. He's he's a misogynist and a, and a racist and making all the worst characteristics of people come to the fore. There are his uh, his sponsors and his workers and his people, the people who are running that ca this campaign and saying, please, Mr. Trump, don't yeah. be negative. Don't be vitriolic. Let's talk about the issues because that's what voters want to hear about. Sure. And he says, I, I, I'm, that's not who I am. I talk personally about this. And the vitriolic stuff is, is you know, is pretty deep, you know. You can call, you can call the vice president, uh, Harris, Vice President Harris, a lot of things. Stupid is not one of the people, one of the ways that people would describe Ms. No. Harris. It's just no. not. Uh, he talks about no. how he's better looking than she is. Like anyone asked about that. Who cares? I mean, so where's the seriousness here? It's hard to find, because that's not who he is. Uh, 2025. That, that whole program put together yes. by the Heritage Foundation is very much who he is. And if people think because he says, oh, I don't know anything about it, that, that that's true. Well, you know, it's not true because he says he claimed he didn't even know what the Heritage Foundation was. He's met with the president. He's talked of the Heritage Foundation. He has talked about it. He's talked about 2025 and J.D. Vance is deep into it. Let me ask you a ba basic question. Uh, you, you, you froze just for a split second when you said the 2025 mm -hmm. program that he discounted saying, I know anything about that. There are a lot of Republicans who want that to become the law if he becomes president again. Yes, and that's a very scary thing. If people take the time, and you can't read the whole document, it's it's huge. But if you read the relevant parts of it, it should scare you to death. And people who say, oh, that's not gonna happen. we I heard people say that before in the first Trump term. He wasn't gonna do some of the things he said he was going to do. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to monopolize things. He wasn't gonna try to be a dictator. And he did, he did the thing, believe what he says. And frankly, he's in that particular instance, actually, I'd say this one is don't believe what he says, because he pretends he knows nothing about the 2025 Heritage Foundation outline of how to have a government. And if you read it, it is very much putting all the power in the hands of the presidency. It's a dictatorship, which should come as no surprise, since his favorite people seem to be Putin, uh, you, you, Kim Jong-un, you, you name a dictator, and he'll tell you what good relations he has with him. How many Republicans are not going to vote for Mr. Trump? What percentage? Do you have any way to, to, to measure that? Oh, gosh. No, that's very hard to, to measure. I don't know. But there there are lots. And you know what's interesting to me is I was grocery shopping yesterday and then went into another store. And in each of those stores, tellers just spontaneously said to me, one said, I've been watching the convention and, and it's so uplifting. It's so great. And in the other store, I don't know how the conversation started, but it was the same thing. They feel hope. They feel positive. And that's what we are as Americans. We're hopeful. We're positive. We can get things done. And I don't think the negative message that Donald Trump is is uh, talking about all the time is really going to resonate at the end of the day. It's still it's going to be hard. His people are going to vote. No question about it. And it's could get ugly after the election because he said quite frankly and very clearly that it's going to be a rigged election unless he wins. Do you think, um, that, did, you th did you think that this would, this, well, he has already said that. Yes, he has said that. And if he loses, mm -hmm. uh, there, there could be some interesting situations around the country. No question or fingers are crossed. Uh, we're talking about no vitriol, no violence, none of that stuff, no matter who right. wins uh, and who loses. Uh, let me ask you about, about what you thought of the Democratic Party five weeks ago when Mr. Biden said, I'm not going to run for office. And then a couple hours later said, I'm, I'm voting for my, I'm recommending uh, the nomination of my mm -hmm. vice president. Uh, did you think, because it, it looked like it was in chaos. Is that what you thought? And did, how quickly did it flip over like that? Well, it was almost instantaneously. I mean, there were so many people worried about Joe Biden, particularly after that first debate yeah. when it was clear. I mean, being president takes a lot out of you. And, and God bless Joe Biden. I think he was the right person at the right time. And he kept this country stable. He kept our relations with our allies strong. He's done it both in NATO and in the Far East. I mean, he has been the person that we have needed. Yep. Now inflation's finally going down. We've, we've seen there, there are a lot of things, positive things to talk about. Infrastructure Act, all sorts of things that got through bipartisan legislation. But it was time for him to step aside. And I know everybody says, well, he was forced. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure on him. But he had the delegates. It was his nomination. 
And he finally decided, and I know it was a tough decision, that it was best for the country to finally hand it over to the next generation. And that's what this Democratic convention has been showing, the next generation. And I have to tell you, if you're a Republican, you've got to be a little nervous about the deep bench that the uh, Democrats seem to have, particularly in their governors across the country. There have been some really strong speeches, very articulate and very charismatic from those governors over the nights. Former Governor Christy Todd Whitman, thank you so much for being here on Up Close and good luck to you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. And always a pleasure indeed. And when we come back, our political team with their take on what happens for the next three plus months in the race for president. Welcome back to Up Close. Let's get right to our political team, political consultant Hank Scheinkoff and Rick Klein, who has a lot of titles by his name now. ABC News political director and chief of ABC's Washington Bureau. Not that you don't enjoy and deserve every one of those titles. Rick, let me start with you. And, and Henry, you, you two think about this. What a difference five weeks has made. We talked about President Biden with you guys this last month, uh, stepping down from running and the Democratic Party in chaos. The convention's over. This party seems anything but in chaos. What's the state of everything, Rick? What a remarkable turnaround. I mean, you think about the alternate reality where the Democrats gathered in Chicago with Joe Biden as their nominee, and it's impossible to imagine that you would have any near, near the energy, the enthusiasm that has been everywhere, uh, not just at the convention city, but across the country. Kamala Harris and Tim Walz just breathed life into this party and into this campaign. They've turned things around in a, in a really major way. Uh, and, and I've heard over and over again, traveling around in, in Chicago and elsewhere over the last uh, couple of days and weeks, it feels like 2008 to Democrats. And they were going into this really dreading their prospects and now they could not be more excited you've been working for this party and for its uh, uh, elections uh, henry for decades what's your take on it yep uh, my take on it is that they have now become the party almost of reverse ronald reagan or reverse george bush uh, one why they're upbeat they're excited they're happy they have a strong message for the positives of america what it can be and they that's their way of dealing with the negatives that donald trump is soon to throw at them all right, let's look into that. I want to talk about the convention, but let's look at that and bring Mr. Trump in. What's his state of play right now, Rick? Well, I think I think the Trump campaign is um, is still reeling from the, the change in uh, at the top of the ticket. Uh, we heard Trump kind of saying out loud what we've heard for a while, which is that advisors want him to focus on policy, but he wants to focus on personality and personal attacks. I think this race, look, I think I, I presume that Kamala Harris and Tim Walz get something of a bump out of the convention. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's over. It's still a very close country and a closely divided country. Uh, something I've heard from Trump land is equilibrium. They want the race to kind of settle back into a rhythm uh, after uh, after the convention. We're only uh, you know two weeks away from. The debate that's going to be on ABC, that's a high stakes moment. Obviously, it's still a winnable race for Trump, but the prospects look so different than they did when he left his convention city in Milwaukee based, yeah. uh, barely a month ago. Yeah. Uh, Hank, it, it's, it seems to me that a lot of the people that are supporting Mr. Trump, who are running his campaign, say, hey, let's not talk about nastiness and vitriol and everything else. Let's talk about the issues and don't trash the people. Don't call, you know, Harris dumb i think a lot of she's a lot of things but dumb is not something she is uh you don't, right. don't say you're prettier than she is nothing like that talk about the issues and he doesn't seem to want to do that because he doesn't know what to do he's used to performing in one way and one way only now he's being asked to be something he's never been which is <laughs> a leader of america to come up with ideas that are less personal but more public He's just, it's not his milieu, it's not how he feels comfortable, and it's not what he's used to doing. And the theme of this Democratic convention, to both of you now, uh, so Rick, we'll begin with you, um, it was about joy. I mean, say they, we're, we want to be happy here. We're bringing Republicans into the tent, literally, of that convention. Um, so that was certainly what, you know, uh, all the speakers counted on at this convention. It's what they really hammered home. What did you, what's your takeaway after leaving this and with a, sort of their spirit therein? Yeah, it doesn't sound that complicated, but it truly is the secret sauce so far to the Harris yeah. Walls ticket. It was smiling, uh, being being happy, being joyful. Um, I feel like that they've tapped into something powerful inside the Democratic Party, maybe beyond, where people want to be excited about something. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. And and I think that if they can maintain that, it's a powerful thing. Now, of course, when you break down on issues, when you start talking about the state of affairs and people focus on, on what's going on in their lives, maybe there's reasons to be glum. And state of politics is certainly not an uplifting one right now. But for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, weeks at least, there has been uh, joy inside politics, and most of it has been coming from the Democratic side. And the words here, I think, Hank, bipartisanship, that is what people are really pu pushing this last week. 
They're pushing, they're pushing bipartisanship, but they're pushing a new form of American patriotism, which is we have more to agree on, more to do together, and less to do with beating each other up, either fists or by any other means. That's the difference here, and that's why the Democrats are in much better shape right now. Uh, Hank and Rick, thank you very much. As always, gentlemen, we'll see you thank next you. time. Take care. Thanks, Bill. All right. And we'll be right back. That's going to do it for this edition of Up Close. TMO with Joe Torres is coming up next. If you missed any of today's programs, not to worry. I'm going to post today's segments on my Facebook page sometime tomorrow. And you can also watch the show on our new podcast on any of our ABC7 NY platforms. Thank you all for watching. I'm Bill Ritter. And for all of us here at Channel 7 Eyewitness News, we wish you health and peace. And let's take care of each other.